One of the things I want to show you guys, which I think you've probably all been beaten over the head with already, is that we have a lot of people on this planet. What you'll see is you already won the evolutionary lottery by getting to be humans. Find yourself on this chart. Like, forever, there were hardly any people around. And then we got something right. We actually solved a bunch of problems that made it possible for people to live. And now we have a whole lot of people. And one of the things people are really good for is making more problems. <laughs> so what we're trying to do is figure out how do we invent solutions to the new problems. And what I think about it is that it helps to go back and visualize the scale of the problem that you have, do a little bit of arithmetic, understand what the real challenge is so that we can invent appropriate solutions to that. So my job is I work in this lab. What we do is we try to invent solutions to big problems in the world. This is our machine shop. We bought one of every tool in the world. We hired one of every kind of scientist. And then what we try to do is go um, after the problems that we can find. So <laughs> as an example, we have a big problem with powering the planet. So a way of visualizing that, this is a cubic mile of oil. So imagine a mile wide cube that's a mile deep and a mile tall. It's five Eiffel Towers stacked on top of each other high. That's how much energy we used in the year 2000 to power this planet and all the people on it, right? So now we use about three and a half cubic miles of oil per year to power the planet. Okay, that's just since 2000. What we need to do is come up with an additional one and a half cubic miles per year over the next couple decades, right? Because of population growth and because people are getting excited about using electricity and stuff, I don't know. But what's interesting is that if you had all of your master plans for conservation and uh, energy reduction employed, you'd only need an additional 1.8 cubic miles of oil per year. If you did swimmingly and got everything right and everybody cut back, you'd only need an additional 1.4 cubic miles of oil, right? That's the difference between doing a really good job and a great job at conservation. Sadly, there's not a lot of evidence that we're doing a good job at all. So by 2050, because we're going to run out of oil and have less coal available, we're going to need an additional four or five cubic miles of oil to make up for uh, the loss in that ability to provide that type of energy. So we need to invent new ways of powering things. Alternative energies have helped. There's a whole bunch of ideas there. You know, windmill is one of them, solar. These are things that we are investing our attention in trying to develop. But for example, if you put windmills over all of those states in the middle of America, the biggest, most powerful wind turbines we have, you'd compensate for one mile, one cubic mile of oil, right? That reduction gets us one back. And then what do we do? Put windmills in your backyard, right? So we have a big problem. This is interesting stuff. A can of uranium the size of a Coors Light has as much energy in it as 120,000 barrels of oil in one can. If you put a pump in your Prius and let it run until the bill was $12 million, that's how much gas you can offset with a single can of uranium. But the thing is, it's wasteful. We actually dig uranium out of the ground we put it through this complicated enrichment process to make it fissionable so it can be a fuel in a nuclear reactor. And we make a lot of nuclear waste. This is nuclear waste stockpiled. It's radioactive, it's dangerous, messy stuff. We don't know what to do with it. And we just pile it into the horizon, right? We don't have any plan for that stuff. It turns out if you have a nuclear reactor today, the end-to-end -end fuel cycle, when you take that can of uranium, by the time you've burnt it in a reactor, 
all we've gotten is 0.7% of the energy out, right? Now that's still a lot of energy. The rest of it is sitting in stockpiles. So we invent a new type of nuclear reactor, a reactor that's powered by nuclear waste. So instead of digging up additional uranium, we just take the stuff from that stockpile, burn it in our reactor, it gets enriched inside of our reactor, and we get a whole lot more of the energy out. This is, well, this illustrates neutron bombardment, so you can see how enrichment works, making U-238. But the, I'm gonna show you, in our reactor design, what we do is we put nuclear waste in there, we light it up at one end with a little bit of enriched fuel, that creates this leading wave that enriches fuel, and the second wave that burns it. So it burns from one end to the other over the course of, in this design, 60 years, like a cigar, right? This scheme can save us a lot of the headaches that we have with today's reactors. So what happens, remember I told you, you get 0.7% of the energy out of today's reactors? Well, with our reactors, we get all the energy out and we clean up nuclear waste. It's a safe, modern reactor designed with computers instead of with slide rules. Now, today's reactors are cool, but literally we haven't designed any new reactor technology in 40 years. This is a stockpile in Kentucky with 700,000 metric tons of depleted uranium sitting on the surface of the Earth. In our reactors, we could power the entire planet, including growth, for about 1,000 years. You remember these guys? with their blackberries. <laughs> um, <laughs> this is an interesting thing. The 99% in America, can you find yourself on this chart? <laughs> Represents the top 14%, uh, sorry, top 14% globally. That's you and I, that's all of us. That's everybody you know. I mean, I said you were an evolutionary lottery winner. You are a socioeconomic lottery winner too. You won two lotteries already. You're at the top of the food chain and the top of the world. So I think that's pretty exciting. What it means for me personally is, you know, I'm an inventor, I'm a human, I'm an American, I already won the lottery. So the truth is I don't have any actual problems, right? I got some kind of fake problems that I worry about, but I don't have any real problems. I have like practice problems, right? <laughs> What I need to do is figure out how do I work on some real problems? This is an interesting way to think about it. Anybody got one of these things? They're cool. That thing costs as much. The amount of money you spend on iPhone is equivalent to the global median income for a household, right? Most people in the world make as much money in a year as you spent on an iPhone. That's pretty awesome. It's okay, you get to keep your iPhone, but it means instead of making fart apps for your iPhone in your spare time, which we have plenty of, <laughs> maybe you could find a way to work on some actual problems. So this woman is loading vaccines into a styrofoam cooler so they can be transported across Africa to a remote clinic where um, they'll sit there probably not stay cold long enough, and we'll inject them into kids, and about 20 to 50% of them will fail, right? Hundreds of thousands of people, mostly kids, die every year this way because we don't have a way of knowing that the vaccines went bad. They didn't stay cold enough long enough. So we invented this thing, which is a kind of super thermos. You can load vaccines in there, stick it in the sunshine, in the Sahara, with no external power, come back six months later and your vaccines will still be cold, All right? There's no power jack, thank you. Um, but this is the kind of thing that really is based on very fundamental understanding of science and deploying the kinds of brains who can think this way to come up with this idea, right? So, we're trying, now this is something that we've licensed out, different companies manufacturing, commercializing. We don't make products, we just try to invent them. This styrofoam cooler 
can keep vaccines cold for four hours, right? Okay, so you guys have these kinds of gadgets in your house. Really interesting thing about that is it used to be this big like analog CRT. Now what's inside of there? A power supply and some computer chips, right? What's in here? Power supply, computer chips. That's the new Tesla. Guess what's in there? Power supply, computer chips. Almost everything in the world that you use right out from under you has turned into a computer. And that's because computers are a great, easy way to add a bunch of features and reliability and whatnot. But we used to do things in an analog fashion, right? With mechanical stuff. So this is a pipe organ. But each pipe in that organ is an antenna for a different frequency, right? And it resonates at that frequency. But what do we do now? Well, we don't use pipe organs. What do you think is inside that? Synthesizer. Probably a power supply and some computer chips. And we use that to emulate what the pipes can do, to resonate at whatever frequencies we want, make music. If you have a, a satellite in the sky, I guess I have to hold this clear, with a dish on the ground, what happens is you're resonating an antenna, that dish, and the dish shapes the beam so it aims at the satellite, right? That works fine until you put the dish on a car or a plane. It has to be mechanically gimbaled so that it can steer and aim at the satellite. So for example, when you look at um, <laughs> those big, uh, domes that are on boats, what's in there is a steerable dish so they can get on the internet or make phone calls, right? When you look at a predator drone, that bullfrog shape is actually there because there's a steerable dish in there so it can talk to satellites so kids in Nevada can control it with a joystick, right? That's what's going on. <laughs> so we invented a new type of antenna using metamaterials. Now this is a new area in science. These are materials that don't exist in nature but that we can manufacture that give us cool superpowers. In this case, we've made an antenna with a tunable dielectric so we can make a flat panel antenna that can electronically steer a beam and aim at satellites with no moving parts and it's cheap to make. And I can stick that on the roof of a car or the roof of a building and it'll find satellites, steer a beam, and aim at them. This is interesting because every new satellite we put up has more communications capacity than the entire network did last year. We have an obscene amount of capacity in LEO satellites. The only way to talk to them now is with steerable dishes. Well, think about what's going on in the world. Can you find yourself on this map? Probably the bright part. Well, that's not where all the people live. This is a map of the world. Here, there goes Africa, India, Asia. That's not, this is a map showing where the internet is, right? You guys get the internet. Those people who don't have iPhones, they don't have the internet. So using this antenna technology, we can get gigabit wireless to everyone on the planet via satellite. We'll get them lit up, we'll get them on the internet. And that's the kind of thing that we hope can help change the world. So thank you, I'm done.